larceny car brakes. Our first larceny car break is at 3283 Partridge Street. Uh, this was a patrol case. V the victim reported he observed an unknown male enter his work truck via surveillance footage and contacted us. When they were on scene, the residences at 3249 Partridge Street called 911 and explained an unknown male was in their backyard. We set up a perimeter and were able to capture the suspect. He uh, later made admissions, admissions uh, reference to the offense and was charged with burglary of a conveyance. This case was cleared by arrest. Our next, uh, actually our next two uh, larceny car breaks um, are on Wander Drive in Deltona. The first one's at 1012 Wander Drive and the second one's at 1022 Wander Drive. These two cases were connected and both were TOT to CID. So we got video surveillance from the area and it seems like there's two juveniles working around uh, during the morning hours. It's, uh, it's the Early weekend. morning hours being like two o'clock after midnight. Yes, correct. So. Uh, the common denominator here, I mean, all these car brakes are preventable. Uh, every single car, and even the auto thefts that we, we discussed prior, uh, the vehicles were left unlocked. In some cases, the keys were in the vehicle. Uh, in one of these car brakes, the keys were in the vehicle. Uh, in the majority of them, nothing was taken, uh, except, yeah, it, was, it was only some chargers, phone chargers. Um, What's We're interesting is that this isn't their first rodeo because they're wearing gloves. Correct. They're wearing gloves. They got they're masks. Ski masks. So they they, so. Um, they they know that there's ring camera footage out there. We've got with their uh, with the association there. We uh, they share the picture in their uh, in their Facebook uh, <laughs> Facebook page. Um, hopefully, we'll get some more information as time goes by. But it's. It, it's pretty, these are pretty recent cases, so and it looks we're working like on them. On foot. Doesn't look like there's a car. Correct, there's no car. Uh, looks, to me, it looks like they're, they're staying somewhere with, with a friend for the weekend, and they decide to, to go out for a stroll at 2 in the morning, see if they can uh, check some car doors. Uh, Carla, what do you uh, got to kids in the probation for in that area? We don't have anything in that, in that area. So, again, um, as the sergeant was saying, these kids are coming up, so we think they're in, coming in, visiting um, their friends and hanging out because the time period is always the same. Brian, what do we got for curfew operations? Uh, we're running a curfew operation um, in and around the uh, Halloween uh, time towards the end of this month, um, and then we'll typically run some curfew operations in the, around the holiday season at the end of the year. So what I'm saying is, during, I mean, obviously with this pattern, or, or we just patrol actively looking for... Oh yeah, undoubtedly. So we have um, all of our night shift guys are briefed on this. We put out intel bulletins. Um, we have one of the uh, most proactive and efficient shifts on night shift right now. It's Charlie shift. They've been in here before for some accolades when we did a public comp stat meeting. Um, they're like a patrol version of CST and they're all out there trying to run down these juveniles that are out at night just loitering, pulling on handles and things of that nature. Oh, let's get into the next one because we're talking about juveniles again. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so we, let me hit the Blackburn one real quick. That's a gun yeah. out of the car. So yep. uh, our next one's 2830 or 2890 Blackburn Avenue. Uh, this gentleman reported that um, on the 27th of September, he realized he had not seen his gun box containing his nine millimeter handgun uh, in approximately a week or so. He, kept, he advised he keeps his gun box in his 2017 Chevrolet Malibu and that he believes it was stolen out of the car. This was TOT to CID. So we, we identified a suspect, uh, Stephen Gaines. Uh, apparently this gentleman is a homeless individual who the victim knows because he had let him stay at his house previously. Uh, we don't know where he is because he's homeless, <coughs> but he's got charges on him. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, Trying to locate the gun, uh, he probably sold it for a couple hundred bucks. Uh, we've checked pawns, there's nothing on pawns on him. Now for the next one's at 2465 Tranquil Lane. This encompasses a few uh, up connected cases, and this is one that has multiple juveniles involved in it. I'll go ahead and, this was TOT to CID, I'll go ahead and let them explain the uh, circumstances surrounding it. Just like uh, the other car brakes we discussed, uh, these vehicles were left unlocked. Um, in one of these cases, 
there was a farm in the, in the vehicle that these juveniles took. One of them was a 17-year-old that we arrested, Trey Vasquez. Um, we talked to his mom, we talked to his, uh, to his siblings at home. Um, he did finally tell us where he hid the gun. Uh, apparently he gave the gun to his 14-year-old brother who was out there with, with other juveniles in possession of this gun. So we finally got him to return home and then we arrested him as well. And we recovered this handgun, but it's, it's a pattern when people leave their cars unlocked and they leave firearms in there and here you got juveniles going in and stealing these firearms and uh, endangering themselves and endangering the public out there. I, I like when the 14 year old said that they were out car hopping. So car hopping, is yes. Their, is their term, their terminology here. And at least you recovered the gun before they got to use it on anybody, so. Right. Good stuff. And mom was cooperative, which was good. Mom was very cooperative. She's a single parent. Um, God bless her. She's got her hands full with his two boys. Yep. Um, so. Carla, what are we looking at with uh, DJJ and, uh, and these lads? Well, the um, one brother who was charged with the gun charge is still in DJJ, and the younger brother is currently on an electronic monitor. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. Our last larceny car break of this period is at 1408 East Hancock Drive. Uh, this victim observed a male, approximately six foot tall, approach the vehicle and enter the vehicle. The male ended up fleeing prior to our arrival. We established a perimeter and used a, a, a lot of resources to try to capture this person. Um, the suspect got away. We did not catch him in, in, in the act. Deputy Campbell, uh, who used to be a part of our um, VC3 analyst, is now a patrol deputy on there. Uh, unfortunately, we still didn't clear this by arrest, but she put a lot of legwork into this. She found multiple cameras in the area. Uh, we located a Bluetooth speaker. Everything was processed, but we were unable to get anything that had identifiable characteristics. Uh, and we didn't get any LPR hits for a suspect vehicle. So the case was closed, um, but it was not for a lack of effort in Deputy Campbell's uh, side. Okay. Moving on to robberies, the next seven robbery entries on this consolidated report are all domestic violence in nature. Uh, the reason that they are listed as robbery is because of the circumstances surrounding them. Typically a phone's involved, somebody uh, smacks it out of their hand, snatches it from them, uh, they get injured or some sort of fear being put uh, instilled into the victim. Uh, with that, uh, the FBI's definition is a robbery. Uh, so these are still domestic related they're not they're not random robberies throughout the city with that said Except we had normally there's a fight somebody shoves or punches somebody the other party goes to the police any part of the phone out of their hands and yes sir and then that now it's a robbery uh known suspect nobody's being targeted um so uh just I, I feel like it was important to mention that because we did have seven of them on this period. It looks like we had this big robbery spree. We did not have a robbery spree. It's, it's, it's all combined in those domestic violence numbers. Um, with that, we had seven of them. All seven of them were arrested. Um, the moving on to... I mean, they, they, I mean just, just to say, just as an example, uh, without mentioning anybody's name, the suspect the one defendant suspects his wife, who has been cheating on him throughout the evening of 9-10, followed her in a separate vehicle to several locations throughout Volusia County and Deltona and confronted her several times. Later, at their home, they become to become involved in an argument. He grabs her wrists and attempts to get her smartwatch from her to check her messages. Thereby, he's arrested for, you know. Correct. And that's, that's what we see. Yeah, and many of these are the same. You know, the next one down is the defendant uh, uh, threw a bowl of cereal at his significant other's face. Uh, she called 911. He snatched the phone from her so that she couldn't contact 911. Uh, they all read similarly. Most of these people, you know, one of the suspects here is zero and zero on felony and one and zero on misdemeanor. Another one's one and zero on felony and seven and one on misdemeanor. Uh, I believe we had another zero, yeah, felony zero and zero misdemeanor. One and one, you know, a lot of these guys, it's it's domestic in, in, um, in nature. Most of them are not substantial criminals, and a lot of this stuff probably did stem from the hurricane and the preparation for it and the stress related to it. So we always carry a fairly high number of uh, DVs, but they're rarely classified as this many robberies on one comp stat period. Uh, but like I said, all of them were CBA'd, everybody's accounted for. 
Uh, so moving into our armed robberies, our actual robberies that occurred in the city in our area of responsibility. Uh, is the first one is at 625 Elderon Avenue. Uh, this one, uh, we put out a, a news bulletin on it, uh, and it was where this guy shows up with a mask, claims to be the police, robs, robs the victim, uh, and then flees the area. This was TOT to CID, and they did a great job wrapping this up. Uh, for this one, uh, during the struggle with from uh, the suspect and the, the, the victims, he, he had, the suspect had dropped a briefcase and a cell phone. Uh, we were able to identify him that, through that's the items. A good clue, right? Yeah, <laughs> they could all be that way. Uh, so we were able to identify him, get an arrest warrant for him, and he was picked up in Osseo ten days later by the, the marshals. That was that was really good. That was good. And we're we're seeking a second person who could be involved. Not in that one, but that one. that one's going to be tied to the other well, one later on. Go, 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 you might as well go into it. Yeah, There's two so, incidents that occur. <clears throat> right. So 625 Elder on about um, two two days later or so, uh, there was another incident involving this same victim where he was outside loading up for work. He owns his own business. He was out by his truck. A vehicle pulls up. Masked guys jump out, point a gun at him, pistol whip him, beat him up good. Uh, that is going to be related to this armed ro this armed robbery that we just discussed. Uh, but with less suspect leads, it's still TOT to CID, um, and they're working to identify multiple other suspects that are involved in this case. Yeah, we've identified two potential suspects right now. Um, <clears throat> wanted to shut off his cell phone, so it didn't put him in the air, but we're still working on, on, on other avenues for that. And uh, we've, there's a total of four involved, and we've identified two so far. Very good. Our next armed robbery is at 1706 Urbana Avenue. Uh, V1 reported that he pulled into his driveway when he noticed a small black passenger car back into his driveway as he was exiting the vehicle. He observed the front passenger of the vehicle exit and point a pistol at him. The victim ran into his garage, but he recognized S1 and observed the, dri the driver of, of as S2 exit the vehicle and pursued him into the garage. The victim stated he was attacked by both suspects, punched several times, and his gold chains were pulled off of his neck. This was TOT to CID. So apparently when they showed up there, they were wearing masks. During the uh, physical uh, altercation there, the victim was able to pull the mask of one of the suspects and identified him as this uh, soon-to-be no-more son-in-law. <laughs> so we, uh, we located him, we arrested him, and he had both necklaces on, on his person. Um, okay. And, and soon to be ex son in law, soon to be son in law? With soon to be ex son in law, no more. No more. Okay. <laughs> I like how you phrase that. Okay. Uh, that concludes our robberies and our armed robberies. Moving on to, we had one ag stalking incident. It's 200 block of Dalton Avenue. Uh, this we had. A, a juvenile that was born in 09 walking home from school when an unknown male approached him and tried to uh, ask him if he wanted to have a ride home. The ride was declined and he, the, the defendant, Jonathan Rivera, uh, became uh, much more persistent trying to get this kid to get in the car and drive home with him. Uh, this was handled by patrol. They located Jonathan, got a positive ID uh, and arrested him for aggravated stalking. This case was CBA. Um, Mr. Rivera is 2 and 0 on felony and 1 and 1 on misdemeanor. Anything more will come out with this, what this guy's problem is? What were you trying to do? No, um, I don't know that, uh, I, I don't know why he did this. I think the patrol sergeant believes that he stopped to offer this kid a ride, um, probably for some sort of nefarious reason. Uh, and then when he got told no, it just made him mad. So he became very persistent and, and called the kid, you know, a bunch of names and just was being, uh, blatantly uh, rude and, and uh, not letting it go. He just wouldn't drive off. So we never did figure out the original reason for stopping. Uh, somebody but somebody we got to keep on our Correct. Our yeah, we, screen. no doubt. Sure, he's been added to one of us so far that we need to essentially have on him for a future instance of that. Is this DNA capable? Did he get his DNA? With this charge, will that have, have triggered that? Uh, we did. So we got it. Okay. Yeah, he was arrested for aggravated stalking. Like I said, um, he wouldn't come off of what what 
possessed him to stop in the first place right and it was the behavior afterwards that was concerning that he didn't just snatch the kid and drive off or, or anything like that but we got him apprehended uh have him positively identified bulletins were put out and he's certainly somebody that we're gonna have to monitor good for the young man Uh, moving on to our abuse and neglect cases, our first one's at 2436 Del Barton Avenue. This is a DV incident where the victim, uh, victims are juveniles. D1 is a family member. They all live together, uh, and it just was a DV in, involving a juvenile, so that's why it's a, an abuse case. Uh, it was CBA'd. Um, our next abuse case is abuse and neglect case is a, is a true negligent case. It's at 101 Howland Boulevard, the Walmart on Howland again. Yep. Uh, this one, uh, Mr. Killenbeck was left with the responsibility to watch the victim's two children. Um, the mom went into the mom of the children went into Walmart and went to shop. The two children were in the back seat of the vehicle. Uh, he was tasked with keeping an eye on them. At some point, the, he passed out. The two kids exited the vehicle and were wandering around the Walmart parking lot unsupervised. Uh, people called us. We contacted them. When we made contact with them, the defendant was uh, unconscious and clearly intoxicated on um, under the influence of narcotics or alcohol or something that was alter in the way he was able to uh, function. That's twice in the last month. We almost had the kid could have easily died at the airport a couple of days ago. Correct. Right. Pop being all drunk up, leaving the kid in the hot bar. And here, thank God for the customers at Walmart uh, that intervened and made sure that, that we were called. Yes, sir. Uh, DeJorn Killenbeck, uh, born in 87, and he's 1-0 and on felony and 5-0 and on misdemeanor. He was arrested. DCF was notified. Um, he was arrested for multiple counts of child neglect, possession of narcotics, narcotics paraphernalia, and tampering with evidence. Our, uh, moving on to ag assaults, our first ag assault is at 975 Keel Hall Road. Deputies responded to an aggravated assault complaint following an investigation that determined D1 would, had committed the offenses of aggravated battery and false imprisonment along with child abuse. This stemmed from uh, the two victims driving on a private road. D1 confronted the children with a firearm, pointed the gun at them. Uh, everybody, including the defendant, statements corroborated, corroborated the allegations. And Jonathan Sheehan was arrested for ag assault, false imprisonment, and child abuse. Uh, Mr. Sheehan is 3-0 and on felony and 1-1 and on misdemeanor. Our next ag assault was at 415 in Howland Road. Uh, V1 and V2 responded to D4 and reported they were traveling southbound on State Road 415 near Howland Boulevard on their way home uh, when they had a possible road rage incident. A firearm was pointed at them, and uh, this was DOT to CID. And this one, we spoke to the, the suspect. He did obviously denied having a firearm or owning one. Uh, there's no video surveillance in the area, and the video that the victim took did not, did not show uh, a gun in the video, so that one's closed. Our next, we're moving on to aggravated batteries. Our next one is 625 Elderon Avenue. That's the one we already discussed. It's related yep. to the home invasion with the uh, guy faking to be the police. Mm -hmm. Our next aggravated battery is at 1382 Howland Boulevard at the Just One More Bar. Um, V1 reported that D1, who was known to him at the time, arrived at the front of the business. D1 then got out of the vehicle with a Sawzall tool in his hand. He went over to the political sign belonging to the victim, cut it with the Sawzall, causing $200 in damage. V1 and V2 went outside to confront D D1 and what he did. He entered his vehicle and intentionally backed into the victim, which subsequently injured his knee. Bystanders tried yelling at D1 to have him stop because he'd hit the victim. He intentionally struck the victim again with his vehicle, and then he fled the scene prior to our arrival. This. Uh, Deputies made contact with the defendant at his residence, and he admitted to the offense. He claimed that he was in fear. Uh, it was apparent that he was not in fear, and he was arrested for aggravated battery and criminal mischief. This case was cleared by arrest. Christian, all over a political sign. All over a political sign. And probably some alcohol. Like probably uh, some uh, alcohol. Christian, Christian Moran, uh, is felony is 1-0, and, oh, and misdemeanors 2-0. Two, two oh. uh, like I said, this was CBA. Aggravated battery, 1167 Balfour Drive, Daltona. This was a domestic violence incident. It was cleared by arrest. Uh, we are now into our domestic violence aggravated. All of our domestic violence aggravated account for 
six in total. Uh, five of the six have been cleared by arrest. We have one warrant that is active and uh, out with patrol and CST to be apprehended. And our simple domestic violence uh, battery cases are 43 in total for this CompSat period. 41 of those have been located and arrested. Two of them have passed on 707s that are active uh, to, with patrol and CST to apprehend them as well. We got the traffic. So our traffic unit uh, has been busy, especially with the, the hurricane. Um, the city fared well for the, the hurricane. Uh, flooding was probably the largest issue. Um, outside of our normal day in and day out calls for service, uh, flooding was the next uh, biggest issue that, that the sheriff's office handled. Um, with that said, for that week leading up to this, our traffic unit was tasked with manning all of the uh, sinkholes, the flooded roads, uh, worked hand in hand with the city on getting barricades out, um, attended many of the meetings, uh, and the traffic sergeant was the day shift EOC sergeant uh, that uh, helped flow all the traffic through the city during the storm and, and immediately thereafter. Leading up to that, there are three weeks prior to that, um, they have been focusing hard on the Howland Providence construction area and then we had three schools where we were seeing our most violations. That was Discovery Elementary, Delta and Middle, and Timbercrest Galaxy area. Timbercrest Galaxy area is typically a, an, an issue. Um, they've hit all of those hard. The Deltona traffic unit itself has wrote 134 citations for this period. Uh, that is supplemented by District 4 Patrol, who's wrote 176 traffic citations for a total of 527 citations written this period. Um, our motor units also worked 62 crashes and made 26 misdemeanor arrests for this past, past four-week period. Um, Two, two incidences of note was earlier this summer, early summer May and midsummer June. Um, Carlos Palmer was in May and Robert Shavers was in June. They were both the drivers in a traffic homicide. Um, we have not been back to a city public homicide meeting since this, these cases were wrapped up and solved. Uh, arrest warrants were obtained and both of those suspects were arrested for vehicular homicide. What um, locations of the homicide you have where I, do not have the locations of the May and June one. Bo I believe both of these were the Howland THIs, though. Um, I think the one was farther east by the high school, and the other one was down the one closer to uh, Wawa. But don't quote me on that. But both subjects, uh, Robert Shavers was arrested out of county for vehicular homicide, and Carlos Palmer was arrested in county for vehicular homicide. So both those guys are in custody. Just for people's edific edification, do you want to explain to them why the traffic homicide occurs in May and June and it takes till October to make an arrest the process that has to be able to go through? No, absolutely. So the initial um, the initial incident in and of itself is incredibly time consuming. Vehicles crash, we determine we have a fatality or a potential fatality. And the reason that the roads are shut down and the reason it takes so, so long is because they bring out um, a piece of technology called a Faro. Um, probably one of these guys could speak a little more articulately on that, but it's a, it's a scanner that scans the whole area and does measurements and takes pictures of the vehicles in three dimensions and all that so that it can be downloaded to a computer for uh, analysis. On top of that, they do all their measurements to determine speed. Uh, making sure that those measurements corroborate with what was scanned and things of that nature. So that's the initial on-scene, uh, cliff notes of the initial on-scene investigation. From that point forward, um, there's uh, blood draws back at the hospital, uh, search warrants are required for that. Those are taken and then sent off to be analyzed by a, uh, by a doctor so that they can do a, a, a math algorithm that will tell you what their blood alcohol was at the time of the crash because it's drawn number of hours later. From there, they're doing search warrants on the vehicles to take the um, computers out, analyze the computers for speed when the brakes were applied, if they were applied, uh, and any contributing factors to that. Um, then it takes a human to actually sit down in front of this computer and put all of this together to create a story so that we can present it to the state attorney's office for charges. Um, so. You know, by the time they put all that together, have the meeting with the state attorney, and we get the warrants issued, then it takes usually uh, at least a handful of days to try to run these guys down, figure out where they're at. Most of them know that they're at fault. Most of them know that you know, they're going to have to pay the piper at some point. So they become very difficult to find as this investigation goes to conclude. 
Um, so that's typically the, the time frame. So these were resolved in about 90 days. That's pretty efficient. Um, some of them, uh, more serious ones, can take up to six, eight months, maybe even a year if it's multiple victims or multiple suspects. So that's kind of the cliff notes of a traffic homicide investigation. Um, both of these were alcohol related or, or narco narcotics related. Um, so it takes a little bit more time to get that process through the, uh, through the court system. Um, but they were both held accountable. I believe they're both still in custody. And um, we are up, I think, already year to date for traffic homicides in the city, are we not? We're at 11. At 11, okay. So. Thank you. It's yes, a sir. lot different than a typical, you know, somebody goes and commits a whole bunch and shoots in it. We can't be in custody 24 hours. Correct. The next case, they take a long time. No doubt. Yeah, I mean, you have to be able to prove um, fault. You have to be able to prove uh, that there's con these different contributing factors. Yeah. Uh, not to go into too many, you know, too many details, but we had a recent one in the District 6 area with a motorcyclist. Yep. Um, at face value, they look like one thing, but then as you analyze the speeds and the, the time of day and, and what all was going on, sometimes you get a completely different picture. So, Thank you. All right, narcotics, two of the things I want to touch on is we're seeing, you know, this rainbow fentanyl that's going through our kids. Uh, we seized a foot press out here that was actual fentanyl, it wasn't what it was meant to be, and then the MDA, whatever those characters are, that was had the, the, the chewable characters that turned out to this at least with MDA. So can you start with that? Right, no, absolutely. Um, so, so my area of responsibility is uh, special investigations, which is narcotics or crime center. Um, and if, if, if you would indulge me, I just kind of want to say kudos to, to my team that's working their tail off. Um, we're working contractor ops, alcohol operations, gambling operations, narcotics investigations, and our uh, crime center is doing a phenomenal job of putting the pieces together, helping the deputies, helping the detectives. Um, they went so far as work from home during the um, this tropical storm that, that came through and um, they didn't miss a beat. I mean, there were, there were a few limitations working from home, um, but they, they've been doing a phenomenal job. So I just want to say kudos to that. Um, Lieutenant Cobb actually mentioned the, the shift that found those drugs, found the, um, the, uh, the pill press and the, um, those little tablets that basically look like kids' vitamins. Um, they're, they're doing a, a, a great job on that shift, and um, they've actually helped our detectives immensely identifying uh, information and informants and target, target locations. Um, we are seeing a trend. Um, I would say a uh, majority of those drugs are, are coming from Mexico, um, as, as you and uh, Chief Henderson saw firsthand. Um, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of drugs that are coming across the border. Um, and it's, it's to the point where our, our local meth heads and uh, meth users, they're not even making methamphetamines locally. It's so much cheaper and easier to just buy it off the street. So um, definitely making an impact, but um, please be aware that these uh, multicolored pills, they, uh, they look like real pills, and unfortunately they're laced with fentanyl which is uh, probably one of our leading causes of death in, in young people uh, in America. So um, it's, it's definitely scary to, to see. And the pills that we seized in the press, they were, uh, uh, looked like, it's labeled to be Oxycontin and what was the other one? Xanax. Xanax. Xanax, yeah. So, and you're, and you're taking 100% fentanyl. Right, right, which in, in most cases can, can be deadly. Right. Um, that's uh, 80 to 100 times uh, more powerful than um, heroin. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's some scary stuff. Uh, just a, a snapshot of, of what our narcotics unit is, is doing for the community here in Daltona. Um, they've done 10 search warrants this year. They've made 75 arrests. They've seized five firearms, uh, about $85,000 in uh, drug-related currency. Um, uh, Two-thirds of a kilo of cocaine, uh, almost a half of a kilo of heroin or, or fentanyl. Uh, oftentimes those drugs are, are laced together, so it's kind of difficult for us to separate. Um, they're charged with, with possession of fentanyl, even if it's uh, laced. Um, on the, the contractor out front, you know, we, we took a proactive uh, approach with 
um, knowing that the storm came through and that there's going to be some um, nefarious people that are going to take advantage of uh, our citizens. So we uh, worked with uh, Commissioner Bradford and um, identified some, some houses locally that uh, throughout the county that, that we're using to, uh, to try and um, identify some of these uh, nefarious uh, contractors or, or handymen or out-of-state contractors that are not licensed to, uh, to operate here in the state of Florida. So uh, we vetted uh, over 41 contractors. We, we have made two arrests, one last week and one this week. I think, um, I think it was yesterday or two days ago. Yeah, yesterday. So, um, thank you, Sarge. Yeah, the, the team's doing an awesome job, and, and we're actually vetting all this information through the Department of Business and Professional Regulation. They're the ones that that oversee these uh, licenses uh, and, and trades, and uh, they've been phenomenal. Um, thankfully, the um, the investigator that we work with, she's reassigned to South Florida, but she's been extremely helpful. Uh, working with Sergeant Carlisle and his, his team. So um, I, I, on the alcohol front, I, I did mention that. We uh, checked uh, 64 stores countywide. We made 39 arrests, which um, is, is pretty, pretty disturbing that they're, they're selling, you know, more than half uh, to, to our undercover deputies that, that are actually underage. So that was an alcohol and tobacco operation. Um, 17 of those stores were here in Deltona that, that we checked. Um, overdose stats, just a, a, a quick snapshot. Um, we had 146 overdoses year to date, which is about 9%, and that's in Deltona. That's about 9% of the countywide numbers. So for a city that's so large, those numbers aren't that high, which is a good thing. Um, and out of those uh, overdoses, 85, um, we've had 85 overdose deaths in, in the city of Deltona. We've had 245 countywide, and uh, for the first time this year, this week, we're actually down a um, little less than 2% than on our overdoses countywide. Um, so we're still pushing 300 for the year again. Like the fourth year in a row. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. We're on deaths. That is. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of the overdoses and the the pill press and these uh, character pills, um, within the past few days, the person that isn't necessarily directly related to pushing those and making those, but is an associate of that, overdosed on fentanyl. <laughs> so uh, it's not only killing everybody in the community that's using it. The guys that are making it and using it as well are overdosing. Uh, and I was, he had overdosed more than once, but this one killed him. Just uh, one, one more example. It, it was kind of a, a dis disturbing case that, that we had yesterday in, in DeBerry. Uh, we did a search warrant on a house, uh, normal um, 2,000 square foot residential house. There were 14 people living in that, 14 drug addicts living in that house. No power. Well, the power was yeah. off coming up with generated no water. Right, right. And I, I did hear, I don't know if it's true, but I think as our SWAT team entered uh, and were clearing the house, they actually, and one of the wires arced. Um, it was, yeah, it, it was a scary situation. Um, we ended up making six arrests out of that residence and the, uh, thankfully the city condemned the house and, and it up, yeah, yeah did, did an awesome job. And uh, we, we have a great partnership with the, the city of Deltona, the code enforcement, very helpful. And um, I think that's all I got for my update. Thank you. Carla? Chanel, Center Center is on track to be open November 18th. Um, we have a few. Anything else about it? Uh, Deputy Commander there, or Brian's Assistant Commander, Dave, you got anything? Yes, sir. You want to talk about uh, what's, what's going to happen with the school? Yes, sir. Schools. Uh, we're actually entering into a school board uh, pass 
Eric, anything you want to add? Eric to the right. You Eric to the right. All right. Yes, sir, uh, Sheriff. Uh, I just want to touch on the, the homicide um, from July in uh, Deltona on Lehigh Drive where the uh, son shot the father. Um, he's currently in jail in Lake County for attempted murder on a law enforcement officer from the uh, apprehension from Lake County Sheriff's Office. He's been charged with that homicide and uh, a second degree murder and currently will stay there on a no bond until obviously he answers for his charges in Lake County and uh, we're ready to try him on our case here um, as well. Uh, with, I just want to echo Sergeant Amazi's uh, information about unlocked cars uh, for stolen firearms out of unlocked, out of cars. Uh, countywide, we've had 80 cars, 80 firearms stolen out of cars. 43 of those were unlocked. So uh, you can just imagine how easy it is for these kids that are wandering these neighborhoods to be able to just open the car door and obtain a firearm. Uh, 18 of those were in the sheriff's office. That's the good news. Only had a uh, total of 80. 18 of them were in the sheriff's office jurisdiction. Uh, as far as stolen guns out of houses, uh, countywide we're at 145, 129 of those were out of the sheriff's office. But one of those houses was up in uh, District 2 in the Deland area where um, an individual had 98 guns stolen out of his house at once uh, by a family member. Uh, that family member has been arrested and we are working on recovering those firearms. All right, that's good. Anybody have any questions? Rinse. Don't have a question on comments. There's coffee refreshments and stuff in the back, and it was donated by Fresco. Uh, we apologize for being a little bit late with the coffee, but please don't leave without, um, you know, uh, with anything, with anything, with anything, with anything, with whatever. And if I may, uh, on the 22nd, also having the first responders uh, recognition event at Fresco on Friday, so we'll be we'll be we'll be participating. Um, yeah, we'll be participating. Yeah, I, I do want to thank you for bringing that up because uh, I think we want to thank the community for what they did for us during Hurricane. We were stacked with food, right? Oh. Water, Everything as good. more than more than you could eat. The businesses here in the city of Deltona uh, didn't hesitate. If we asked for anything, they provided it, and most of them we didn't even have to ask for anything. They came to us asking what we needed. Uh, Lowe's provided us pallets of water that we were able to deliver to Stone Island, uh, Mims area off of 46, uh, and out in Osteen near Pell Road, where some of the very substantial flooding was. Um, we had more than enough boxed food to feed all of our deputies plus the supplemental judicial services deputies and school resource deputies that we had uh, supplementing our patrol. I don't know if, if you guys know, but we double staffed our patrol functions um, for the night and, or for uh, at no day, charge, don't tell at day and night. So we had <laughs> we, we had uh, probably anywhere between what, 40 deputies maybe in service at one time, and all of them had plenty of food, water, Gatorade, everything that they could have needed to work through that storm successfully. Um, and in that short duration where they weren't able to leave the office, uh, they were well taken care of. So the, uh, all the businesses here in the city it, it, were very grateful, very appreciative, um, and I think it just furthers the, the relationship that we have with them for all the, the different contacts we have for the shopliftings and things like that. So uh, a lot of these uh, loss prevention officers are the main conduit between the commun communication of the, the corporation and us, uh, and I couldn't thank them enough as well. So. And that is why uh, Fred Coles is having the first responders presentation on Saturday, and they will be acknowledging uh, all of you, so please, even if it's just to have a cup of chocolate, please stop by and just say hello. Don't 
Do you know what time Fresco's was putting that on? From nine to one. Nine to one. And that's, you know, that's what we stuff in the back is all the back. All right.